Christ's name, amen. 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 Would you take the word of God, please, and turn with me to Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. We're talking about the ins and outs of the Christian life. And uh, we had the greatest example given to us in Jesus Christ. And then here is Paul, another example by which we follow somebody who is living for the Lord Jesus Christ, who has been consumed by this great life. Why? Because he is possessed of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is following under the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we learn that there is a purpose uh, by which Paul lives his life, and there is a purpose to achieve. And in the set in Scripture, in verses uh, 12 through 16, it says this in Philippians chapter number 2. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, starting verse number 12, it says this. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always uh, obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So we have this setting, and we kind of call it covered verse number 12 and verse 14 through 16. You see yourself, why did we skip verse 13? Don't worry, that's what we're going to cover tonight, verse number 13. Uh, but in verses 12 and verses 14 through 16, we learn about there is a purpose to achieve and there's a purpose to work out. And he said that phrase, wherefore, uh, basically off of the example, the pattern we've read of Jesus Christ. And because of what we have in Christ and all that Christ has done for us, now let us work out our own salvation. This is not, as we've talked about several times, this is not figuring it out, but it is putting it into practice. Uh, taking what we know and what God has told us and what the Bible says and, and living it out, working it out, having a sound workout through sound doctrine, which in sound doctrine would produce sound morals or sound uh, a way of living. And then a purpose to be sanctified or set apart. We talked about a sanctified attitude by remembering or and telling others about blessings or maybe writing some things down and uh, praying for a grateful heart. And we finished up with a sanctified awareness. In verse number 15, it says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We have to have a biblical awareness, a Holy Spirit-filled awareness about the world we live in, the world that says that these beautiful children that are being brought in the world can be taken out by some human being. That's a travesty. Uh, they live in a world today where when people don't, things don't go their way, they begin to riot and they begin to loot and they begin to hurt innocent people. We live in a crooked and perverse world, but yet Paul's trying to encourage them that we are to live a Christian godly life even in the midst, right in the middle of this crooked and perverse world. People like Daniel did it. He lived a, a faithful life and he stood head and shoulders above the rest of the people that he was 10 times greater or even innumerably greater because they stood for the Lord Jesus or they stood for God, I should say. And we know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood for God and God preserved them. We know that Joseph stood for God even as a slave being sold into slavery. And when he was tempted with somebody that I'm sure was extremely attractive and Potiphar's wife, and he, he said, how can I sin and do this great wickedness against God? It wasn't, what if we get caught? It wasn't, this isn't the best thing to do. It was, how can I sin against God? How can I do this great wickedness against God? You see, so it's totally possible to live holy in a crooked and perverse world. Amen. Matter of fact, Peter challenged people during times of persecution under Nero to stand for the Lord. Strengthen the brethren. It's not a time to be weak and to fold our arms and to say, what are we going to do? It's not worth it. No, Paul encouraged us to, to take a stand and live blameless, harmless, the sons of God. Be, 
people that are becoming of a Christian without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So we're to stand out. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to have a sanctified attitude and have a sanctified awareness, realizing that people are going to hell. Not everybody is going to heaven. Not every church preaches the gospel. And not everybody that wears a cross around their neck is going to heaven. But all of those people could go if they were to put their faith and trust in Christ. But then there's another purpose. There's a purpose to follow the plan. And we talked about holding forth the word of God. The plan is found in the word of God, which we're going to get a little more into that in depth. So the word of God should be held forth by pointing others to the word of God as the only answer for all of question, life's questions, for the solutions of all of life's problems, for the comfort of all of life's sorrows. This is the word of God. So the purpose we are to achieve as Christians is to display that Christ changes lives and we can follow every word. So now we see that there is a purpose, but there is a power to receive. And that's what we're going to find out in verse number 13. In verse number 13, it says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, it's interesting. Remember, it comes off the cusp of working, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then it begins with, for it is God. The fear and trembling. Working out what God has given to you. God has given you salvation. And um, when you first get saved, it's not like everybody says, now I know exactly what to do as a believer. I know how to walk. I know how to talk. I know how to act. I know. No, you don't. We read the Bible and we work it out. <laughs> we continue to surrender things to the Lord and we live this life. We work it out. For it is God. The reason that we do what we do is because it's all from God and all of God, all planned by God. So there's a power to receive. The principle that Paul conveys is that Christ must work in us before he can work through us. And too many people follow God because of pressure from the outside instead of influence from the inside. You see what I'm saying? I could get up here and say, we need laborers, we need laborers. Well, I might as well volunteer because he's going to ask me anyway. That's pressure from the outside. And don't get me wrong. We should ask people and challenge people to pray about things, to step outside of our comfort zone. But it should, is a far greater impact when it's the influence within that moves you than pressure from without. Often people feel pressured on the outside because they are not right on the inside. Yeah. Now listen, there have been times, and I just listened to a message the other day, that I felt the pressure from the outside because I wasn't where I needed to be on this subject on the inside. But that's the great thing about the Word of God. You read the Word of God and and the Spirit of God convicts you about something and says, hey, that's for you. And you can respond to it. You can do something about it. And you can be right with the Lord and live in great victory. God is more concerned with the workmen than the work, I believe. God deals with people, right? God deals with people. He wants to work in the hearts of men and he works through these people. So if he's concerned ultimately about getting to the point of people getting saved, then he has to deal with the individual vessels. And so we see that the Bible says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. God took many men and developed them into leaders that he needed them to be. Think about people like Moses. Moses' life is kind of broke up pretty neatly, 40, 40, and 40. And it took 40 years God developed him before he would use him as a leader. And God has taken other men like Saul, who was a religious leader, and, and God got a hold of him and changed his life. But he used a developmental period. He was blind for three days. And then he would go off and serve. And God's developing you right in this moment. And he's working in your life and moving. 
And when you come to this verse, it says, For it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of, of his good pleasure. And many people will see that word work and say, well, what do we do things if God is just working and causing us, putting our will in there and causing us to do things that we just sit back and wait? Uh, no, the word worketh there means to energize. So think about that. It says, for it is God which energize. That's where we get our word energy from. He is putting an energize. So have you ever heard somebody talk about the moving of the Holy Spirit? The energy. <laughs> it's that energy. And so as we're reading the word of God and we are praying and God is allowing certain circumstances in our life to happen, he's using that as an energy, a moving, if you will. The Holy Spirit saying, hey, this is where you need to go. This is how you need to do it. And you need to respond as such. It's God that's doing these things. This is why we must be careful when we say, well, God wants me to do this and God wants me to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as that is what God wants you to do. Have we ever seen in Scripture where somebody said God told them to do something or God provided something when he did not? Yes or no? Jacob, perfect example, right? Yep. Esau goes off and he says, son, go get me the venison such as I love, prepare it, make it, and I'll give you this blessing. And mom comes and says, hey, by the way, your brother Esau went off to get this venison and, and he, he's going to bring it back and your daddy's going to give him a blessing, but you're going to get that blessing. And we're going to go ahead and I'm going to have you go out and get a kid and we're going to kill it. We're going to make it just like he likes it and we'll dress him up like your brother. You're going to do your best Esau impersonation. And we're going to get this blessing. And Jacob says, well, I can't do that because then he'll think I'm a liar. <laughs> How many times have you thought to yourself, it's not that you're worried about lying, you're just worried about getting thought of as a liar. And that's where Jacob was at. He'll perceive me as a liar. And he did it. And uh, he brings it in there and the father says, how did you find it so quickly? And Jacob said, the Lord gave it to me, but the Lord did not give it to him, did he? No. And he tells him to come closer and he perpetuates as he says, you smell like my son, you feel like my son. You don't quite sound like him. Are you really my son Esau? Now, isn't that awesome that God will give you an opportunity to be honest with him even when you've already lied to him? And Jacob said, I am him. And that wasn't true. And later on, he'll have a confrontation with him again, won't he? He'll have a confrontation with an angel. And it's interesting because the angel will ask him a very unique question that I believe ties into that experience. And he'll say, what is your name? And he'll have to confess to him, my name is J Jacob. I'm a deceiver. I am a supplanter. And he says, you'll no longer be Jacob, but you'll now be Israel. You see, when God does something, he does it right the first time. Yeah. And so let us be careful when we go and say that God is doing something. So God develops these leaders and he works in them. So we have to be careful because our, our flesh has an energy as well. In Romans chapter 7 verse 5 says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Um, what is that energy the, that the flesh has? Well, I just feel like this is what God wants me to do. Well, this would be a good thing to do. We must be very careful not let our feelings overpower the moving of the Holy Spirit. What energy does the devil have? What kind of influence? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 says, Wherein in times past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of a disobedience. There is a great power. I watch video after video of people that are deceived by this world. People that are deceived thinking this is it. People that want to question and throw a fist in the face of Almighty God. And it's sad because they need the Lord Jesus. 
you know, Charles Spurgeon had a quote that said, when people die and go to hell, may it be with us hanging onto their legs, begging them. May it be with our teeth being with them because we've fought and clawed and bite to try to get them to come to know Christ. May it never be said that we allow them to go in without ever any influence from us. That is not a direct quote. That is the synopsis of that quote, okay? You're going to go look that up. I'm like clawing, biting. I don't see. No, uh, that's the synopsis of what he was saying, all right? But it's true. There is such influence in this world. The energy of this world is against God. The Bible says it's enmity. But the power we have is a divine power. It says, it says, for it is God which worketh. It's God who gives the energy. Remember, after salvation, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there was a promise of a divine power to each believer. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea, and in Samaria, and unto all the uttermost part of the earth. There's the power of salvation and the power of the Holy Spirit, which develops into a power of the witness. You cannot be a witness until you have first witnessed something your own self. Have you been changed by the blood of Jesus? Have you been saved and born again? The witness within allows you to witness without. So this energy, that energy has to be put into something. And so what are some tools that God gives us to use this power? And number one is the word of God, most important tool that he's given to us. For it is of God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. How is God getting what he wants into us? Obviously, we know there's a miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. But God uses first and foremost the word of God to penetrate our stony hearts, to direct our feeble lives, to encourage our weak hearts, to bring about the joy of our life comes from the Word of God. The Word of God, something we should receive. Paul writes about it in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when he received the Word of God, which is heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is truth, the word of God, which affectionately worketh also in you that believe. Now, I want you to think about this. We talked about this before, but they're hearing the word of God. Imagine if we didn't have a copy of the word of God and I'm standing up here and I'm telling you by the authority of almighty God, this is what he has said and this is what you need to know. Now, today and age, that would not fly anymore. And I believe God knew that, and that's why he preserved and gave us a final authority and, and a final word. It used to be a day and age where your word was your bond, a handshake was a contract, and to go back on that was, whoa! You would ruin your business if you said one thing and did something else. But he says, you're following the word of God and it's effectually worketh also in you that believe. In other words, because you have not only heard the word and believed it, but you have received it. We'll talk about it in a little bit. So it can impact your life. Aiden and I were talking just this evening and we talked about how we don't make the Bible real enough for us. And what do I mean by that? When you read about Paul and Silas, do you picture and can you see in your mind's eye just as enough as it was me and Keith in a prison getting beaten for our faith? Can you see that or is it just a story? Can you see Moses leading the children of Israel uh, through the wilderness and their shoes are, aren't going destroy and their clothes are holding up? Or is it just a story? Can you see Elijah calling down fire from heaven and, and great judgment being upon those 450 prophets of Baal? Or is it just a story? This all is real, except for where God is saying, this is a poem. God really created the world in six literal days. He spoke this world into existence. 
Jesus really came to this life and lived and did miracles and, and taught the multitudes and, and made even the teachers astonished by the things that he said. He really did give his life for you and for me. He really did cry from a, cruci a cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He really was buried and he really did rise again. He really did ascend up to heaven. He is really alive today and forevermore. It's not just a story. It's not just a series on TV. Listen, if you're getting more Bible information from some TV series than you are your own Bible, something's out of whack. I'm not saying to, that you can't watch that stuff, but I'm saying this is what you need. He says, for it is God which worketh in you. He works in you through the word of God. He wants you to know him. Raymond Barber says every time, right before he preaches, says, you know that every time you open up the word of God, you're opening up the mind of God. Let's see what God is thinking about tonight. I love that. Every single time. The first step every believer must come to in living the Christian life is that it is the word of God. It doesn't just contain the word of God. It is the word of God. That's the first step you must come to. For it is God which uh, worketh in you both to do and to do, uh, do uh, worketh in you both to do, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Today is not a good day for quoting, apparently. All right? When we read the word of God, we, uh, may we read it with great privilege that the creator God of the universe has given this to his laborers, has given this to his followers, has given this to all of his children, those he loves, because he wants you to know him and to know him greater. I want you to think about this. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4. We find here in Matthew chapter 4 the temptation of Jesus. And he had been fasting, and he comes out and he's a hungered, the Bible says, and in Matthew chapter 4, we see that the devil has tempted him and told Jesus, if you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus responds in verse 4 by saying, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What I love about this is Jesus, the God-man, the man who turned water into wine, who healed the blind, who fed the multitudes, who walked on water. All things I cannot do. The only one of those I could do is feed the multitudes, and I would have to change my name to multitudes, okay? Uh, but I could never do what Jesus has done. None of you could. But I can do this. I can use the word of God to fight against Satan and any temptation that he has given me. Do you think that God did that for a reason? Do you think that God allowed Jesus to reference back during his greatest time of weakness and temptation outside his crucifixion by using the word of God, knowing that his people would use the word of God and that's how we would combat against Satan and struggles? Absolutely. Absolutely. But also, he's confessing again that something that is essential for his physical body, bread. He's saying that the word of God is more important. And not only that, but he's also inferring, I believe, that just as you need outside of fasting, you need bread daily, so you need the word of God daily. Every day. Do you wake up, friend, to the word of God do you get your Bible devotions in? Do you spend time with God that he might minister to you and speak to your heart? Because if he is going to do a work in you and you are going to bring about good pleasure to him, then you've got to get in the word of God. And it's got to be every day. We can't just rely upon Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. We've got to dig in the word of God each day for ourselves. Do you imagine having your children, allowing somebody else to love them for you? That's a foreign concept, right? You have your children to love them yourself. And you love them. You don't just, don't get me wrong, some days they test this, but you love them every day. 
And we are needing the word of God daily for strength, for wisdom, for healing, for direction, for encouragement, for enlightenment every day. The word of God is our final authority for faith and practice. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. How do you know how to live this life without the word of God? How do you know how to please God without knowing the word of God? The author of this book is the author of our faith, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that we was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what must we do with this tool of the word? Number one, we must appreciate it. Appreciate it. The word of God is unique. Hello, it's a unique book. It is God-breathed, inspired, infallible. The word of God is powerful, the Bible says. It says quick and powerful. It's alive. The word of God is inspired. If we see a Bible as just another book, it will never energize your life. Never. May we not get more energy from a devotional than we would the Bible. And I am not condemning or saying we should. Matter of fact, I think it's good that we would have a devotional. You know why? Because you need to hear from people that don't think like you. I need to hear from people that don't think like me. That's what I love about devotionals. They're small, they're quick, and they get the wheels a turning. The daily bread that Brother Gary brings in all the time. I love those because they're not to supplement. I shouldn't just read that little booklet and be like, okay, that's good for the day. No, 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 no. That is the spark that lights the flame that should carry me into the next study of my own as I get into the Word of God. Some of the greatest things God has ever given me in preaching have come from a devotional a thought during a devotional. There have been times I've done a devotionals and I read that devotional. I thought, man, that's a good thought. And God gave me some completely different thought from that devotional. I love it. Why? Because other people don't think like I do. So we need to appreciate the word of God for what it is. If we see the word of God as a movie or a script, it will never energize us. When we appreciate the word of God for what it is, the God-breathed, holy, inspired, all-sufficient, inerrant word of God it will give us the energy for each day. So we need to appreciate it. Then we need to appropriate it or receive it. Don't just read the word of God, receive the word of God. To receive the word of God means more than to read it or even study or meditate on it. It means to gladly take it in, to make, to welcome, to make it a part of my every fiber of my life. How's the word? I love, this is my favorite study of scripture when it comes to this area, Job uh, chapter 23, verse 12. Do we have that one up there? Good. It says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Do you see the word of God more important than your necessary food that you need for each day? Without the word of God, would you be a spiritual hypoglycemic? Listen, many men are fainting for lack of wisdom. This food is for each stage and every moment of life. You remember the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. The word of God is meant to help you grow and to nourish you even as a wee widow baby. And that means that the word of God for all the people that walk around and say, I just can't understand the Bible. There are lots of things maybe in the Bible that you can't understand as a new Christian. But there are some things in the Bible that even the smallest of children can understand. How do I know this? Because the Bible says it's the sincere milk of the word, something that a baby takes in. And it means even the most simplistic. How do I know this? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's one of the most simplistic verses they've given out there. The Bible says that God is love. You know? So there are simplistic verses 
Uh, there are none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are simplistic verses that we feed upon and, and certain things that we feed upon as we grow, but it's help you, meant to help you grow. But from there, we develop and come off the milk, but it's not that you come off the milk. I want you to understand this, by the way. Yes, there comes a time where a baby stops nursing, but there are still liquid nourishment that people need. So don't ever get to a place in your life where simplistic truth is not necessary for you because, friend, you will miss out on the greatest truth. I remember when I first came to this church years and years ago, I heard a man say, you know, I just sometimes I don't want to be here Sunday morning because they really gear it towards evangelism and trying to reach the lost. And man, I've just heard that message so much. Now, say you are diagnosed with some terminal disease and the doctor says, I just want you to know, you have been miraculously healed. You have got a clean bill of health. Matter of fact, you're in better health than you were before you got sick. You have no more disease. You are going to live for a long time. Now, when people came up to you and asked you, hey, I thought you had terminal illness. You're going to die. No. Now, how many people until you said, enough already. I know I'm going to live. <laughs> no, you love to tell that story. Anytime somebody asks you, you're like, yeah, I was sick, but now, man, I'm healed. Like, it's great. I'm in better health than I ever was. So why would you want to stop hearing about the great work of Calvary and the great salvation of Jesus Christ? So there is great power still even in the milk of the word of God. But Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So there comes a point where we study and study and then you get into some of the things like meat. And what is meat? Meat is something you have to chew on. You still have to put it in manageable size, okay? Like I know there's a the guy that thinks he's cool. He picks up the tomahawk steak and he just argh, rips it off like a caveman. But guess what? He's going to be chewing an awful lot longer before he can ever take that bite in. And this is the ideal of meat, is that some of the things he's even confessing by writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that some things aren't able to just be taken right in. Just because I put that meat in my mouth and I begin to eat it and it's full of flavor and um, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. I'm so sorry for all of you that this is taking down. But it's the, the whole experience, it's a delicious cut and you're experiencing the deliciousness of it, but you still got to chew on it. You can't just swallow the thing down and hork it down because you're going to choke. Same with the Word of God. There are some great truth and some great doctrine in the Bible that even after you put it in, you're enjoying maybe the new things about it. Oh, ooh, 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 ooh. But you're not ready to swallow it. In other words, you got to keep chewing on that. You got to keep chewing on it because it demands to be chewed on before you swallow it down. But what happens is, People have somebody they trust and they, and they love, and instead of studying out for themselves, they say, well, this person believes it, and I trust them, so I'm just going to go ahead and live that way. But what happens is they eventually choke on that meat because they have never chewed it up and processed it for themselves. So we need to appropriate it or receive it or make it a part of our every fiber of our being. The Word of God is milk. It is meat. It is bread. It is more important than our necessary food. I will say that like our physical bodies, we often determine what food is best for us. But there is a diet that's been designed for us that's best. Guess who designed that diet? For it is God <laughs> that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we must appreciate it. We must appropriate it. And then we must apply it. We must apply it. When we read God's word and believe God's word, then there is a power applied to our lives as we live out the precious promises of God. So we believe it, we receive it, and make it a part of our everyday life, and then we begin to apply it. Now, in Bible college, they often told us that we should make every Bible truth that God brings us to practical and measurable and obtainable. Measurable meaning that um, if I... Lord, I want to work on my prayer life. I'm going to say in the next 
couple of days, I'm going to spend this much time. See, there's measurable amounts of time, measurable things. But then I need to apply that. I need to actually do it. I need to get up, and I need to die to self, and I need to do the prayer time as I have committed to God to do. So as God reveals to you, and one of the verses I often share with you that I, I feel like I hear a lot, if I'm ever doing my devotions in my bed, I often seems like this verse comes up. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. Okay, Lord, I get it. It's time to get up. <laughs> time to get out of bed. And I always chuckle by that because after that verse, I always, no matter what, get out of bed uh, because I feel like the Lord is saying, hey, it's time to get moving. I've given this to you, now act upon it. And so don't take the word of God and say, oh, it's so good, it's so powerful. Everybody needs it. Everybody does need it, and we need to do something with it. And so take what God has given to you and apply it to your life. Uh, don't just apply it to your friend's life or somebody in the church, and that's easy to do sometimes, right? It's, it's sometimes easy to do this. You point here, right? What they say, three fingers pointing back, right? Amen? And uh, But it's easier sometimes to say, oh, man, that, that's a good truth for so-and-so. Well, if it's a good truth for so-and-so, then it's good truth for me, myself, and I. Amen? And so let's read the Word of God, and let's work on our inner man first. That way God can work in us so then he can work through us for maybe somebody that we've been praying for. We'll come back next week and we'll talk about uh, a prayer and uh, maybe get into our last one. Prayer and suffering are the last uh, things we're going to talk about on how uh, God can, uh, this, this power that we receive. We through, receive it through the word of God first and foremost and then through prayer and then Believe it or not, God uses a power to do a will and do his work in our life, oftentimes through suffering. And we'll talk about that. The church grew in leaps and bounds through times of suffering. And, uh, and sometimes God wants us to suffer. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, next week. All right? But let's pray and ask God to bless this evening. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to get in the word 